So today I'm going to turn to the head and show you that the overwhelming evidence that sharks have gone from being the hunter to the hunted. Sharks are threatened by humans in a number of ways, particularly from fishery. Shark fishery is worth over $1 billion per year. But before I go into more detail about who is catching the sharks and how many sharks are being killed per year, I need to explain to you the main reason sharks are targeted. Shark fin soup. It's a plain tasting soup made by, made by boiling the shark fin for four hours so it loses its tough texture. And then a broth of chicken stock is added to the, give the soup flavour. Now this soup is a dish served at traditional Chinese weddings as an indication of the family's wealth. Now the soup in the UK often sells for over £90 a bowl, depending on the size of the fin and the quality of the fin. And, uh, and, sorry, and the shark fin soup industry has been estimated to be worth over $500 million per year. So some of you may have heard about this problem in Gordon Ramsay's recent documentary Shark Bait. I was just wondering how many of you here watched the show earlier this year? Alex? Good. But for those of you who did not see the show, the fins are removed from the shark, usually while the shark is still alive. The fins are removed and the shark is thrown back into the water because the flesh of the shark is worth little in comparison to the fins. And what is really scary is that over the past 30 to 40 years, the sharks that are being caught are getting smaller and smaller. And now many sharks are caught even before they have a chance to reproduce. But how many sharks are caught each year? One study by Shelley Clark in 2006 found that by identifying the fins being traded through markets in Hong Kong, that approximately 38 million sharks every year are killed with shark fin soup. What does that number even mean? Well, it works out to be nearly 4,500 sharks per hour. So to meet the increased increasing demand for fins, sharks are caught mainly in bycatch in tuna fisheries on boats like this. Bycatch means that the shark was not the target of the fishery, but as the fins are worth so much to the fishermen, then they are usually classed as a valuable secondary target. So the fins are caught and brought into the market. And they are then sorted by size and by quality, and then dried outside on racks. Now this may not look like much, but when you take a closer look, each of these racks holds between 25 and 100 fins. I calculated that in this one image alone, there were 7,400 fins, which would have been taken from between 900 and 1,200 sharks. Now, if this number of fins came in a boat at least once a week, then this one drying area represents over 65,000 sharks per year. And remember what I told you about sharks and how some sharks only produce two pups per year. It's easier now to imagine how difficult it is to replace the numbers removed by fishing. And although artisanal fisheries are usually classed as small scale because of the size of their catch and the size of their, their boats, they actually have quite a large impact on shark populations because there are many hundreds of thousands of these boats in developing countries. The numbers are hard to come by, but one study has shown that between a quarter and a third of worldwide catch comes from artisanal fisheries. So this is something that we just can't ignore. <coughs> Many coastal sharks are also being threatened by coastal development and land reclamation, particularly sharks like the reticulate whip ray, the spotted wobbegong, and the ornate sleeper ray that live in freshwater or nearshore environments. <coughs> As an example, here is the giant freshwater stingray. It's 15 foot oh, no. <laughs> it is six foot wide, 15 foot long, and weighs over 1,300 pounds. And unfortunately for the giant freshwater stingray, it lives in the Mekong River in waters like this. You can see why its population and health may be affected by living where it does. So it seems the roles have been reversed. <laughs> so what can we do about this? <coughs> well, there are many things that can and are being done, but Dr. Samuel Gruber, pictured here, recognised about 30 years ago that human threats, particularly fishing, are increasingly impacting many shark species around the world. He also noticed that there's very large knowledge gaps when it comes to sharks. So together with the IUCN Species Survival Commission, he founded the IUCN Shark Specialist Group in 1991. But what is the IUCN? The IUCN is the oldest and largest global environmental network in the world. <coughs> the IUCN Species Survival Commission is a science-based network of 7,500 volunteers split into at least 120 specialist groups. There are specialist groups on ducks, seahorses, cormorants, sturgeon, bears, freshwater fish, and salmon. 
and the IUC and Child Services Group. So we have grown and grown since 1991, and we now have over 160 members split into 12 regional groups based roughly on Ocean Region. So what do we do? Well, our mission is to secure the conservation, sustainable management, and recovery of the world sharks through the mobilization of global technical expertise. So let me just unpack this. When we talk about <coughs> mobilization of technical expertise, we mean scientists and divers and conservation biologists and naturalists all working together to improve the conservation of sharks around the world. I remember that in all instances during this presentation when I say sharks, we shark skates, raise the penguins. Okay, how do we do this? Well, as I told you earlier, there are still many remaining gaps in our knowledge on sharks. So we work to fill these gaps by producing uh, scientific publications and reports. We've created a number of regional ports in Australasia, the Mediterranean, and here in the Northeast Atlantic, as well as global reports on migratory sharks, those that cross international boundaries, deep water sharks, and pelagic sharks, those that live in the open ocean. So I've actually brought a number of these with me today, so uh, we can pick them up during the break outside. <coughs> We then use the information from these publications and reports to provide advice to decision makers and management authorities, hopefully with the goal of improving the conservation and management of sharks. For example, we have provided advice to the British government on the conservation of sharks in the Chagos Archipelago. The Chagos is a British overseas territory located here in the Indian Ocean between India and East Africa. It is a very pristine environment because very few people live in the archipelago. As a result of the advice that we submitted, and those of other interested parties, the Chagos Archipelago has become the largest marine protected area in the world, and sharks are now protected in the region from nets and long lines of tuna fisheries. <coughs> we also submitted a report to the EU on how to manage sharks in the region. We actually received some exciting news at the beginning of the week that the European Commission has proposed a full ban on finning sharks, as we recommended, but this must now be approved by the European Council and the European Parliament. And finally, a large part of the work that we do is carry out relevant assessments to determine the threat status of sharks. Or to put it another way, we're taking the pulse of sharks. We're looking to see how healthy or how unwell a species is. <coughs> well, I think you'll recognize most of these animals, and I think that many of you will have heard of these terms when people talk about them. <laughs> the extinct dodo, the critically endangered black rhinoceros, the endangered giant panda, and the vulnerable African elephant. Now, a redness assessment is a measure of a species' risk of extinction. We need to measure this for each species so that we can figure out who is in trouble. Is a shark species as threatened or more threatened than the elephant or the rhino? And then we can use the changes in redness assessment to monitor the level of risk over time to see if things are improving through the use of conservation and management tools. For sharks, we use two main criteria to calculate this redness assessment. We look to see if the shark population has experienced a dramatic recent decline in numbers, or if it lives in a very restricted geographic area. Now, each of these criteria has a range of thresholds that are then used to work out which redness category to put the shark into. <coughs> the three main threat categories are critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. And the IUCN terms these as threatened. Those species that are near threatened nearly meet the thresholds for the threatened categories and should be closely watched because if exploitation of these species increase, they may actually become threatened. The least concerned species are safe from extinction and the data deficient species do not have enough information so that we can assess their risk of extinction. However, these could be threatened or least concerned, but we just don't have enough information to make a decision. A redness assessment also compiles all of the information on the species into one place. We include information on the taxonomy, the range map, the population, the habitat and ecology of the species, the threats that a species faces, and the conservation actions in place for that species. <coughs> <coughs> 